if it were not a Sunday, this would be the feast of one of the most popular saints in the church. I think you know who it is without my telling you. Each century seems to have somebody of this kind. They know things. Anyone who would go to Padre Pio in confession would soon find that out very quickly. I came across people in Italy who had known him. One had been prepared for his first communion by him. And he had been waiting a long time for his confession. And just as he was about to go in, one of the brethren had said, that's the end of confessions for today. So we had to queue the next day, he thought, from zero. What was his surprise when the good padre made a beeline for him and said, without knowing, of course, anything he was inside the box before, you young man, come first. He'd waited a long time already. And I was talking to a man called Giuseppe from our village in Italy, who calmly said to him, when I was a young man, before the war, I went to see Padre Pio. There were two of us. He said to us, you, that's to me, will return, you, that's to him, will not. And so it was. One was killed in the war. And on it would go. However, it didn't stop at his death. I used to get things from people who had encounters with him after his death, and they're ongoing. One of the most powerful saints of Christian history. A victim soul. As you know, amongst his gifts was by location. And it will be linked with the gospel that we have just heard, the forgiveness of sins. Power granted unto men to forgive sins. So important was it that absolution should be given to a dying person that he would go off while leaving his body behind. One time, the brethren couldn't understand why his body was so cold. They kept on putting blankets over him, and still he was freezing cold. Eventually, it turned out he had been elsewhere. He had been on the top of a mountain while his body was still in bed, and because of the cold on the top of the mountain, while he heard confession of a dying person, the body also was in chilly mode. And on one could go. And there's not also an absence of quaint stories here and there, indicating how close heaven was to earth in his case. When asked about the souls in purgatory, he just calmly said, if you only knew the number of souls climbing this mountain as I celebrate, and he went on to indicate that it was colossal, they were tugging at his chasuble. Hence we understand why he would take two hours or so, and that he would have a long pause at the memento for the day. Not one was forgotten. That memento is very powerful, and it's a pity that the Eucharistic prayer which contains it has now been put practically on the sideline. One time, his good carer, Ferraresio, who had to always collect him from the confession box, was late. He'd forgotten to put his alarm or didn't hear it. So, he eventually got to him and escorted him, because if he didn't, you know what had happened. The pious ladies would slip away at his habit, leaving very little behind. And so, Padre Pio muttered calmly to Fer Alexio, no use making excuses about your alarm clock, you must get a new one. I am tired of sending my guardian angel to you. It was a real hidden world, and the frontier between 
the beyond of this world was very thin. He was not amused when he saw what was happening, both about to happen within his order, and he formulated one day about making adaptations so as to be pleasing to the young. They must make themselves pleasing to St. Francis. And when it came to what he could foresee regarding the changes, he was not amused. He always, of course, celebrated in the old rite by an indult, although when he died in 1968, it hadn't quite come in, but there were things already changing. He also saw things in the future. He was also asked about many things ongoing, and is known to have indicated that Our Lady was appearing at Garabandal. With regard to the future, he is known to have seen the Three Days of Darkness and to have words about it. I was puzzled when I came across this the other day. If one looks into the annals of Catholic prophecy, one finds quite a few puzzling indications of what might be unfolding in our time. One can go back to the details given in the case of Our Lady of Good Hope, going back to the 1600s. But there are many which are not known and are interesting, although they leave us puzzled. This one is interesting because it is not specifically Catholic, but actually Jewish. Listen to this, just out of curiosity. In the prophecy of Zachary, the Armenian Jew, who converted to the Catholic faith, published notice in 1854, was the edited text of the prophecy of the revelations that he received from God. A father Patecelli compiled the prophecies and published them in a book called Day of Anger, The Hand of God Upon an Empire. That empire is described in its geographical dimensions as occupying the space of what became the Soviet Union and China. That is the empire that will use great guile and deception as we had in the period of détente. That's what happened in the 80s when there was de-escalation apparently of the arms race. And the glasnost and perestroika of Gorbachev before the scheduled demolition of the Soviet Union. And then there would be the war that the prophecy refers to as the struggle of the strong against the strong. This empire of the north, consisting of Russia and China, will go to war against North America. And this 19th century text says that they will fire their missiles on North America, and North America will fall and be conquered and brought into bondage. The next phrase is the most frightful thing of all. It is then that Zachary says, in this text published in 1854, and then the whole world fell under the dominion of the firstborn of hell. I leave it with you, no commentary, but it's puzzling and interesting. What I, however, leave you with is dogma. This is more certain and never changes. They took last confessions importantly and with a certain sincerity because they knew that if it wasn't happening, the risk was loss of the soul for all eternity. And it's not a help to souls to give them a false comfort with regard to mercy. 
Because if one gives the wrong impression that no matter what one does, mercy will always meet us, one is actually favouring the work of the tempter. Because one then nourishes this mentality, oh, well, there will always be mercy. Listen to this. The Catholic Church alone proclaims the doctrine of hell and its punishments. The commission she has received from her divine founder is to convert the nations to the truth, not to adapt the truth to them. In the matter of faith and morals, her duty is to control the minds and the hearts of men, not to be controlled or influenced by them. It is surely an unpardonable offence on the part of some modern preachers, often for the sake of notoriety, to waver and hesitate in fully declaring the truth of the eternal punishment of hell. In the face of the momentous interests at stake, such a mode of action is not charity, but cruelty. For if so terrible a doom awaits the finally impenitent, the surest guarantee for escaping it hereafter is not to forget it now. If the doctrine of eternal punishment be a revealed truth, it is treason to God and treachery to men to withhold or disguise it or tamper with it, because we may choose to think it better to leave them in ignorance of what he has thought it better to reveal. This week I was in a place where time stands still and nothing takes away from the encounter. It's as though one sat on the edge of the globe and saw it turning. Retreat in a place where one is not accessible, where one has adoration day and night, non-stop, and no one can get you or distract you. It's the real thing. And it's very good at the time of the four seasons, the ember days, tempora. Ember means four, four seasons, the four times of the year. It's now the beginning of autumn, since midnight roughly. Well, there it hit me. How even actually, I confess to you, a hermit can be profoundly damaged by modernity. Why? A day, a night, without access to the world, notably through a screen, is very, very different from one in which just for a moment, initially, one puts on the cybersphere. And it hit me. Which do you want? Life in intimacy with him, able to hear him, or just more of the same thing? Bleeps and words, distractions and noises. Life will go by. There's a big difference between one and the other.